Hello and welcome. In this film, I'll be exploring two songs, Music for a While by Purcell and Rejoice Greatly from Handel's Messiah. Let's begin with the Purcell. And for this, I'll be joined by Catherine Edwards on harpsichord, David Lale on cello, and our soprano is Flea Wynne. Henry Purcell was a fantastic English composer who lived in the 1600s. He was born into an incredibly musical family and spent his life working for royalty whilst based at Westminster Abbey. His music splits down into three categories, music for religious worship, music for royalty, and music for the theater. So everything he wrote was written for a purpose. Music for a while was originally written for a play about Oedipus, and it is sung to a scary creature called Alecto, who has snakes in her hair and blood dripping from her eyes. Purcell wrote this back in 1692 in the Baroque period, when instruments were rather different to what we have today. Accompanying the voice, there would have been a harpsichord, the main keyboard instrument of the Baroque period. And the harpsichordist would be playing a part called continuo. This is made up of a bass line and chord symbols or figures. The player would then improvise and fill in the harmonies. The exam board have written out a part for Catherine to play today, but it's very much in the same style as what would have been improvised back in the Baroque period. It has lots of decoration and embellishments that we'll talk about a bit later on. The bass line would have been doubled by an instrument like a bass viol. A viol is similar to a cello, it has a similar shape, but it has frets on the fingerboard, a different bow held in a different way, and no spike at the bottom. We are a modern symphony orchestra, so we don't use bass viols, and for that reason we've made a substitution. You'll hear the bass line played on the cello. The song is written for a high voice, which originally would probably have been a male voice, so a boy or a high countertenor, but today it'll be sung by a soprano. Purcell was a master of a form called ground bass. A ground bass is a bass line that keeps repeating as the harmony and melodies twist and turn on top. The ground bass in this piece consists of three bars that repeat round and round. Now that's an unusual number because it's not a lovely even number like two or four, and that means that the repeats on top are more interesting. Let's begin by hearing this three bar bass line in isolation. The bass line is made up of rising quavers. There are in fact quavers in every single bar of this piece. The bass line splits down into a four note pattern which repeats starting on a higher note each time. The technical term for that is a sequence. So the first four note pattern starts on A, then it repeats on B, C, D, E. The last phrase twists around so that we end with an octave leap of E to E. Now this song is in A minor, so E is the dominant, and that leap of E to E is chord five. That means that at the end of every bass line, we have chord five, and when we start the new bass line, chord one, a perfect cadence. And all this is a really complicated way of saying that the bass line is constructed so that it has to repeat. The right hand of the harpsichord fills in the harmonies and improvises around the melody. There are lots of semi-quavers and embellishments. So let's take a look at some of the ornaments that Purcell uses in this piece. In bar one, there are some grace notes. These are just short notes that fill in the gaps. They sound like this. Sometimes grace notes are placed next to an important chord to create a little delay in the harmony. They sound like this. That little note is called an appoggiatura, and it's there to create a little bit of tension as it clashes with the chord underneath and then resolves. There are also some spread chords. This is the term we use for when the harpsichordist spreads out the notes of the chord rather than playing them all at once. Here are the spread chords in bar 13. On top of that, the soprano has a trill. This just means she alternates between two pitches quickly, like a kind of wobble. You'll hear that later on. And then there are mordants. These are little alternations between notes, and they look like zigzags above the music. There are two types. The upper mordant is an alternation with the note above the pitch that's written and sounds like this. There's also a lower mordant, which alternates with the pitch below and sounds like this. 
The sign has a line through it to distinguish it from the upper mordants. Now these sound a bit weird out of context, but when you put them in a melody line, you start to hear how they decorate it. So here's the melody line at bar 11 without the mordants. And here's that same line with the mordants. And that really is a very distinctive sound of the Baroque period, a time when everything was over-decorated. The music had all of these ornaments in it, fashion had lots of extra ruffly bits, even the furniture and the buildings had things carved into the stone and into the wood. So let's look at the vocal line now. Purcell sets most of his text syllabically. That means there's one note for each syllable of the text. But in bar five, he takes one syllable and stretches it out over two notes. Those are called paired syllables. And you can see them on the words for and a. If you spread a syllable over a lot of pitches, like in bar 10, the one of wondering is spread over seven pitches, that's called melisma. And if you really go for it and spread a syllable over a lot of notes, like in bar 20, it's called extended melisma. The word that is spread out in bar 20 is eternal, which of course means forever. And Purcell is doing this on purpose. When the way a word is set is the same as the meaning of that word, it's called word painting. So Purcell is making eternal sound eternal by stretching it out over so many notes. He also uses word painting in bar 12 on the word pains. This is placed against a clashing chord. The technical term for that is a dissonance. And in the next bar, the word ease sort of eases onto the chords in a series of downward notes. So let's hear a bit of this. We'll pick it up on the melisma on one in bar 10, and then you'll hear the mordants in bar 11 and the word painting on pains and eased. My favourite bit of word painting comes in bar 24 and 25, when Purcell sets the word drop. He places this on the off beat, so it's between the strong beats of the bar, and it moves up and down in pitch, so it really does sound like drips and drops. Overall, the vocal line stretches for the interval of a ninth and it mostly moves by step, so it is conjunct. If there are any leaps, they are small ones. Let's look at the structure now. The bass line repeats around four and a half times before it moves off and starts to develop at bar 14. It's quite difficult to hear this change because Purcell keeps the pattern very similar and he changes it so that he can move on to some new harmonies. At bar 23, the original bass line comes back, but now it's halfway through the bar. So we have to wait until bar 29 for it to return at the right place in the bar with the original melody and the original words all lined up on top. So this return to the music from the beginning means that the overall structure of the piece is ternary form, A, B, A. In songs a hundred years later, this became the standard shape. In Mozart operas, we often see a da capo aria, which just means the back to the beginning song. Aria is another word for song. So here's Purcell sort of inventing this form a hundred years earlier. The texture of this song is melody dominated homophony, or you could say melody and accompaniment. There is a little bit of counterpoint created from the right hand of the harpsichord. So let's listen to the full song now performed by Fleer Wynne, Catherine Edwards and David Lale.
We're going to finish this film with a quick look at another vocal piece, Rejoice Greatly from Handel's Messiah, performed for us by Fleer Wynne with the London Philharmonic Orchestra and their conductor Tim Murray. George Frederick Handel was born in Germany in 1685 and in many ways he followed in the footsteps of Purcell, writing his music here in London and it was music that divided into the same three categories, royalty, religion and theatre. But it was 50 years later and Handel managed to create far greater wealth and fame for himself than Purcell had managed 50 years earlier. His most well-known piece by far is the Oratorio Messiah from 1742, which is still performed around the world every year to great success. Rejoice Greatly is an aria from the first section of the Messiah. Aria is just another word for song. And this one is written for soprano, accompanied by string section, but with no violas and an added bassoon. The harpsichord is still there playing the continuo part. Like Purcell's, this piece is in ternary form, A, B, A, but the return to the A section is a little bit different and the soprano is encouraged to decorate the melody line a bit more. The B section also provides a greater contrast. It is smoother and sadder. There is a lot of melisma in the vocal line. The word rejoice is almost always spread out over several notes. And at one point, the syllable joyce lasts for 48 semiquavers. There's also some word painting. Rejoice often sounds joyous and happy, but also listen out for peace, which is on some long still notes. and shouts, which is rather high in the soprano's range. The whole thing skips along with a question and answer structure. The soprano asks a question, the strings answer it back with lots of decoration, appoggiaturas and trills. So here's the London Philharmonic Orchestra, soprano Fleer Wynne and conductor Tim Murray with Handel's Rejoice Greatly, written 50 years after Purcell's music for a while, but still very much influenced by him.